Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I hope you're uh, going to enjoy this conference. I got to be a, see a, a preview of a lot of what you're going to see uh, at uh, the recent event in Copenhagen. And there's some fantastic talks on, uh, so you're in for a treat. In recognition of that, I'm going to crack straight on uh, because I know that I'm competing with some you know, very high quality uh, alternatives. So if you were sort of uh, umming and ahhing about which session to take, uh, what I thought I would do is set out exactly what I'm going to cover in this talk so that we have a, a fairly clear understanding about what you're going to get. If it turns out that from this little precy you don't think this is the right talk for you, then you can sort of uh, uh, quietly leave. I won't take any offence, and hopefully the people that are left in the room will, will uh, get the right uh, talk for them. So the catchy part of this talk is the setting a good example, but the real title, if you like, is that subtitle. It's about improving your SBE, BDD, and ATDD artifacts. I'm just going to unpack that sentence so that we know exactly what we mean by that. So by improving, I'm essentially talking about uh, increasing the value primarily through extending the useful life of the things we create. I think one of the key problems with mistakes people make is that they're creating artifacts and tests almost as a, as a one-off. You know, once we get to the story implemented, then we're, we're done and we don't care too much about it. That's a syndrome I want to uh, change. Uh, what about this alphabet soup? Well, I'm assuming that you know what most of these things stand for, but just to give you a fighting chance, SBE stands for specification by example, BDD is behavior-driven development, and ATDD is acceptance test-driven development. Uh, we don't have time today to sort of talk about what is the subtle differences between all those things. For the purposes of this talk, I'm treating them all the same. That is, uh, they all have sufficient overlap in terms of what they are as processes, and the advice I'm giving you today applies to all of these, whatever term you're applying to what you're using. Um, and the final part is the artifacts. Now, some people think this might be an odd word to choose. People say, well, you are talking about tests, aren't you? Well, you'll see as I get into this talk that there's a very specific reason why I try to avoid the word tests. Uh, I've chosen artifacts. It might not be the most ideal term, but it's not bad, actually. Artifact comes from the Latin arte factum. It means made with skill. And that's the important thing that I want to encourage, is that people think carefully and apply good skill when they're creating these things. Now, I know people tend to think, well, artifacts tend to be used in an uh, archaeological context. They tend to be old things that are dug up out of the earth. Well, what makes those things interesting to archaeologists is not the fact that they're old, but that they're evidence of skillful civilizations uh, in the areas that they've uh, uh, been exploring. So in our context, though, artifacts means if you're using something like Cucumber or SpecFlow, it's your feature files and your scenarios. If you're using things like Fitness, it's your fitness pages and test tables. Um, but it's really anything, uh, any framework, any tool that supports the idea of executable specifications. But in addition to that, it also applies to cases that you don't necessarily automate. So those discussions about good examples that you might have at a whiteboard, those, those count as uh, valuable artifacts as well. Uh, final point, as I say, the arte factum is the, uh, the Latin origin of artifact, which is why this is the correct spelling, in case you're wondering. Uh, it's only the Americans that tend to use the I spelling, uh, where I means incorrect. Um, how am I going to go about this? Well, uh, primarily I'm going to identify the common mistakes that I've seen teams use when they're starting out down these processes. I'm also going to share some of my tips for improving the style of the things that you create. Uh, we'll take a look at some real examples that we've discovered on our uh, consulting travels. Um, and I'll give you sort of five key takeaways or points to highlight along the way. Um, also, in recognition that I know that the way people tend to take notes in conferences these days is just to photograph slides that they're uh, interested in. Uh, you may have seen already that I'm not using PowerPoint or Keynote. I'm using Prezi, which is this sort of zoomy thing that goes all around the place. Uh, in recognition of that, you might not know when is the right place to take a picture. So I put a little uh, camera icon in the corner of the spots where I think that might be a good summary of stuff to take a photo if you wish to. And I'll pause there. That will give me a chance to take a slug of water as well. OK, so let's crack straight on. It's not an introductory talk. OK, so I'm not going to explain what SBE and BDD are. I'm assuming that you already know that. But 
just to sort of frame the rest of this, this is kind of the one pager of uh, uh, certainly the, the principle behind specification by example. It starts with the sort of general truism that good examples help us understand the general rule in whatever context we might be talking about. Um, in the context of software development, well, requirements are a type of rule and tests are a kind of example. And this little triangle we have in the, in the middle is about the relationship between each of those items. So examples, that is, you know, good cases that we might discuss when trying to understand a particular story or a particular requirement, help us to clarify that case. It helps us to understand the details of what we mean by the, uh, the thing required. And if we've expressed those examples in sufficient detail, if we express them at the right level of abstraction, if we understand the, the correctness of the relationships within that example, then those same examples can serve as tests that can ultimately verify that we've implemented those requirements quite correctly. So that's really SBE in a nutshell. So specification by example. You start with examples to specify the work you need to do. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the, uh, the Pixar film Up. Uh, I have, and I enjoy it, and my kids enjoy it. Um, there's two main protagonists in this uh, film. It's uh, Carl and Ellie. And towards the beginning of the film, there's this rather sweet scene where they, it's, it's, you know, flashes back in time to when they were both six-year-old kids. And uh, uh, Ellie is explaining to Carl that she's got these great plans for you know, having adventures when she grows up. She's going to go to this exotic place called South America. And the way she explains to six-year-old Carl what South America is, is in these sort of slightly hushed tones. She says, South America. It's like America, but South. Now, one of the problems I see with acceptance test-driven development, BDD, and so forth, is that people treat it as a new thing, but they come to it from the context of something they already know, which is TDD. So most people are familiar with TDD, and then they sort of start to branch out into this, this other thing like ATDD. And I'm afraid the level of explanation of what ATDD is tends to be fairly similar to the explanation that uh, Ellie gave Carl. And I think that leads to a lot of dysfunction about what it is that we're creating in that process. In particular, it leads to this dysfunctional thought, that really the thing that we're just creating is just a test. And that's why I said really what I'm trying to talk about is artifacts, OK? There's the, 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 the purpose that we, uh, uh, or the role that these things serve, need to be more than just tests. The trouble is, if we think of what we're creating when we're driving a process as just a test, is the word test carries quite a lot of baggage for a lot of people, especially because in the context of TDD, we're talking about unit tests. That's fine. Most developers have a fairly clear understanding of what they mean by a unit test. But when we're talking about a process where we're encouraging product owners or other business stakeholders to be writing tests, those people don't necessarily have a similar framework of what a test is or what a test should be, what it should look like. So it leads to syndromes a bit like this one. Um, it's, it's a pretty uh, intense thing to read. I don't expect you to have to go through that. But the context here was that um, uh, I was working with an organization that had just started out down a, a BDD route. And uh, I asked to take, take a look at one of the uh, early feature files that they'd created. And this is one that they showed me. And it's this sort of long, very, very difficult to understand thing with a lot of givens and whens and thens. So it's got, it's got the gherkinish kind of sound to it. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's essentially trying to uh, pick this long journey through one of these uh, uh, questionnaires that you might fill out for insurance. So if you know that if you've ever had to uh, insure your car online or something like that, you know that you get asked various questions that try to ascertain your uh, risk. And based on your answers to all those questions, you get some kind of uh, uh, policy quotation given to you. Now, you can imagine if you're insuring a business, then it's a much more complicated process. There's a lot more questions to ask. And so the, the logic of what, how this uh, questionnaire unfolds is really quite complicated. The answers you give on page one will change the questions that appear on page two and so forth. And so there's a long process uh, uh, to go through. And this is sort of picking a path through that. So scenario one just tells us you know, one long 
path through that. There's another scenario, helpfully titled Scenario 2, that sort of goes off down another path. And so you might be thinking, you know, have this similar reaction to me, of, you know, what the failing test is all this? Um, the development team that uh, uh, produced this sort of, I think, got a little bit defensive and said, well, you know, hang on, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got the gherkins, you know, it's got all our givens, whens and thens. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not unit testish, it doesn't refer to any technical terms or uh, implementation details. And then they felt very proud, they said, well, and besides, you know, why should, why should you criticize this? Because we didn't write this, our, uh, our product owner wrote this. So it was kind of a, you know, take that, Mr. Consultant, off you go. Now, I happen to know that the product owner of this team was a very, very capable uh, and good product owner. She was uh, ideally suited for the role. She was an expert in her field. She knew the product very well. She knew the business very well. She was an intelligent woman, and she was very uh, keen to sort of uh, apply any new techniques that would help the, the, the team be more effective. So I was a little bit surprised to hear that this might have been something that she would have spent time creating. So I figured I need to understand the story behind this. So I went and spoke to her and I said, well, literally, what is the story? And it was something along these lines. It says, she said, oh, yeah, that. Well, it's fairly straightforward. It's just that uh, six of the questions in our questionnaire database, uh, they needed slight you know, rewording uh, because the, the lawyers had gone over it and they said we just need to change the wordings of some of these things. And she had her own sort of internal codes to identify these things. Uh, so these things at the bottom meant something to her. So uh, as a little aside there, if, it, if that's the nature of what your story is and you're attempting to apply BDD or SBE to this, uh, that's probably not a good place to start. A simple change like uh, uh, adjusting the values of text strings doesn't really warrant uh, the need for specification workshops and so forth. Um, I would suggest in this case, if you're changing text strings, don't use SBE, don't use BDD, uh, use JFDI. Let's assume, however, that this was an important or high-risk thing and it did need to be clearly specified. We did need to get out the, uh, the specific examples that would support it. Um, you know, what would we need? So I asked her, well, do you have some kind of uh, list of what the, the uh, question text values are um, associated with each of these IDs? She says, yeah, 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 I've got my, my master spreadsheet of all that. And uh, she produced this extract for me. She said, well, these are the six things that need to change, and these are the values they need to be. And for completeness sake, on the right-hand side, this is the, what the text reads at the moment. I said, ah, perfect. We've, we've, we've got it in one. This is your specification. This is the thing that you need to give to the team such that they can drive their implementation and job done. And she looked at me as if I was a bit stupid. She said, well, of course, that's the first thing I gave them. But they said, we're doing this thing called BDD. And they wouldn't write a line of code until I had given them an acceptance test. And hence, the result was that great big long script. So I felt, well, somebody needed to be knocked around the head a little bit here, but uh, let's just focus on what's the, what's the lesson of this. And it is point number one, is that when we're talking about a specification for something we need to change, yes, we want that specification to be testable, but don't think of it as a test, because what we're trying to do is that we're trying to specify what it is that needs to be tested. We're not trying to specify how we'd go about testing it. So in her world, she had no sense of, well, what would be the acceptance test? As far as this product owner was concerned, she said, well, how would I acceptance test this change? Well, I'd have to go and see that the actual, you know, uh, wordings of those sentences came up as I expected, where they appear in the questionnaire. But in order to, you know, get question number six to appear, I need to know what path I need to go through. So she knew the right sequence of uh, answers she needed to give in order to make this thing appear. But that's not what we're testing. None of that logic was changing. So if you could bypass that and just say, can we guarantee this is what the uh, text string is given this uh, index? Is it the right value? That's sufficient. In other words, we, we need to sort of leave behind the, the mechanism by which we test because that's something we can refactor. We can always change the method by which we test. What we're not changing is the thing we're testing. So focus on the what, not on the how. So 
let's go back to this, what I said was the, the fallacious position of believing that the thing we're creating is just a test. Well, it's clearly more than just a test. And it's more than just a test because it's, it has sort of three important phases in its life cycle. So there's what is it to us now, i.e. when we're first discussing a story that we've yet to implement it, what will it be soon, and what does it become later on after we've done the job? Well, the first role is that it's the specification now. It's the specification when we don't, haven't yet done the implementation, and what we need is a co collective or shared understanding of what is the change to be made and how would we know we are done. It serves then as a test after we've implemented, ideally as soon as we've implemented because we've wired up those tests automatically, uh, and we get fast feedback that what we did uh, or what we intended is in fact what we did. But this third role is arguably the most important. I think this is the key to succeeding with SBE, BDD and so forth, is to think of the long term. Rather than just thinking it's a means to an end, it gets a story marked as done, and then we don't need to care about it thereafter, the thing that you create should live on as documentation of the choices you've made. It should be a good description of the behavior of this particular part of the system. Collectively, when you put all these artifacts together, you should be having a nice sort of browsable, coherent set of living system documentation about what your system is capable of and how it behaves. So thinking ahead to that long-term role of documentation is really the key to getting the structure of your uh, artifacts right when you first create them. Now, there is a related uh, idea to this, which is about what is the, uh, the short-term versus the long-term equivalence of some of these things that we create in our agile processes. And for each, you know, the, these, these things are horizontally aligned. So the things on the left are typically short-lived. They're typically a means to an end. The things on the right are the, the, the long-lived equivalent of them. So a story itself is really just a, a scheduling token, if you like. It, it represents what is the change we intend to make, and its primary purpose is to you know, be the, the, uh, the promise to hold the conversation about what we do, but also it gets us to a safe implementation. From that point, what we need is the, the specification of you know, what is the uh, uh, impact or the effect of that change. So the story is about what change do we need to make, specification is about what is the effect of that change. And similarly, a story has acceptance criteria. You, we need to be able to have our checklist of how do we know we're done on that. That may or may not include automated acceptance tests as part of that acceptance criteria. The automated acceptance tests live on. They become regression tests. They, they are permanent parts of our, of our system infrastructure or our quality infrastructure from there on. And similarly, the actual uh, physical artifacts, if you like, the cards uh, on your wall or the, the, uh, the items in JIRA, those can be torn up, those can be archived. But what you want as a result is to capture the essence of what's uh, uh, you know, the, the, the results of the discussions you had, the outcomes of those conversations that, that survive as documentation, that needs to be cared for, that needs to be groomed. You're, you're creating living documentation out of that with a view to making that return value to you over the long term. Now, in these three roles of specification now, test soon, and documentation later, we need to be conscious that we're trying to create one item that serves all of those roles, but in those roles there are competing forces at play. And the way I characterize this is that they, 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 they're sort of, you know, we're, we're trying to find the right trade-off between how we serve each of these roles. So a specification needs to be concise, a test needs to be complete, and documentation needs to be coherent. I'm going to zoom into each of those in turn. So the, the key to a specification is in the, in the name. It wants to be specific. So conciseness about being focused on what is the exact change that we need to make? You know, what is it that's different about this? What behavior is relevant to this particular topic? That's where we get the most value from. And we lose value if we sort of start to uh, introduce too many uh, uh, related but not uh, uh, direct uh, consequences of this particular change. So we have a, an, uh, a tendency to want uh, uh, as, as, as little extraneous detail in our specification as possible. Now, that force competes with the testing role because 
Uh, it's a common syndrome that in a test you'll hear people object to saying, well, it's not sufficient just to test the happy path. It's not sufficient just to test that the change you've required is made. I need to test that there aren't negative consequences of that. So I do need to test around the edges of that change. I need to sort of regression test other things that you know, might have been changed even though we don't think they're related. There's always a risk that I've you know, pulled in some, some strange bug along here. So the, the, the phrase I tend to use is that that's the, the footprint of the test tends to be larger than the footprint of the change. That is, the scope of what we think is valid to include in a test sort of naturally tends to bring in a little more around the, the core of what this change is. So we need to be conscious of that, that uh, competition between the, the conciseness force for the specification and the completeness force for the test. And maybe the documentation force is the thing that unites that. We want coherence in the, uh, uh, the description that we've created of what this change was, what this new behavior is that's in our system. And that's where we perhaps find a balance, because we find that we're going to need to provide enough context after the fact to understand you know, what are the details that we're just specifying here. Um, you know, would this stand up as uh, documentation of a particular part of our system many months after the actual conversations in which we made this change? So we need to be aware of that. We, we like face-to-face -face conversations. We like to be able to uh, shorten our cycle time between the need being identified and the implementation being done. That's all well and good. But the trouble is that change now is part of our system. And when we need to perhaps revisit that area later, we want to be able to go to some reliable documentation that makes it clear what the current behavior is. So the, 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 hence it needs to be self-explanatory. The other point here is that it's, uh, the level of detail that we express in documentation isn't flat, it isn't sort of consistent. A lot of people say, well, you know, unit tests are about sort of code level design issues, uh, acceptance tests should be about user interface issues. No, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think there are certain things that a customer cares about at an end-to-end -end or at a UI level, but a lot of business rules uh, uh, can be completely devoid of the actual UI by which we uh, interface with them. Uh, it's where is the core of your system, where is the heart of the risk in your system. That will be where you want a much greater level of detail in your documentation because that's where the, the, the value lies. That's where your uh, business stakeholders care that you've got it right. So be prepared that you'll have some acceptance tests that will be quite low level, quite specific, quite, quite detailed, others that are quite broad. OK, so having considered the forces, now let's look at the qualities that we expect to see in these uh, artifacts. And there's, again, there's three involved here. We're looking for the appropriate um, uh, overlap or the appropriate intersection of each of these three qualities. First one we'll look at is balance. And uh, coming into another example here, uh, this one actually turned up in an early version of the fitness documentation. So you know, people who ought to have known, known better about how to uh, uh, give a good uh, uh, specification. So it's, uh, the feature is described as payroll, and the scenario is a simple acceptance test for payroll. Uh, so again, much a little bit clearer and more terse than the first example I showed. Uh, again, it's got the given when then. In this case, we're given a set of employees. There's a little bit of data for them. The when that we're uh, uh, testing here is running the payroll, so when we run the payroll, uh, and the expectation, the then, all checks printed correctly. There's perhaps a subclause, everyone lives happily ever after. So the issue here is, I hope, fairly obvious, that whilst you can't sort of argue with the intention of the test, the way in which it's done is really not particularly useful, because somebody's had to do an implementation of the phrase, all checks are printed correctly. So their choice or their, their determination of whether that returns true or false is entirely hidden from us. It's entirely up to the person that's made that implementation. Furthermore, it begs the question, well, is it dependent on that data that's in the given? You'd have to assume so if, it's, uh, if, if they bothered to put that in the test at all. But that means I could change my uh, uh, name you know, from Jeff Smith to uh, Jane Smith well, is that going to make the test fail? What's, what's magical about that data? So it's, it's problematic on all sorts of levels. In particular, it sort of violates the problem of it's got a mismatch of uh, the level of uh, abstraction between my givens 
and the thens. So the tip here is look out for your givens that are relevant to the thens. Everything that's, that's uh, mentioned in the given should in some way directly uh, impact uh, and expect a result you would see in the then. Um, and hence, as tip on the right-hand side, keep the level of abstraction the same. There is also another sense in which we want our artifacts to be balanced, though. And this is this phrase of, we want hourglass-shaped scenarios. And this is just a simple tip that says uh, that the, um, the grammar of uh, any Gherkin supporting uh, tool allows you to say, well, given A and B and C, uh, when D and E and F, uh, then X, Y, and Z. But whilst you're allowed to do that, it's not good practice to do that. The when should really about the thing that you're actually testing. So I like the when to always be a single phrase. Don't say when this and this and this, because that's, that's a bunch of things together. Probably some of those clauses in that are really about setting up you know, givens or preconditions. So it's OK to have you know, given A and B and C, keep a single when, have multiple thens if necessary, and hence you result in a, an hourglass-shaped scenario. All right, the next point is about focus. And here's arguably the, the worst of the examples that we'll, uh, uh, we'll see. Um, so this, this is, a, is a fairly obscure type of uh, test, but let's, uh, let's just bear with us and, and uh, try and figure out what's going on. Now, as you saw with some of the previous examples, uh, the, the role of this artifact perhaps being used as documentation, I think it fails at the first hurdle there. We've uh, uh, not taken any opportunity to put some meaningful explanation as to what this, this specification is trying to show. We've got very brief descriptions here. The feature is called statement, and the scenario is called weekly statement. We have no other explanation of what the business rules are. So we need to almost reverse engineer those out of this, uh, uh, this test. So what have we got? Well. In our first givens, we're creating some accounts, or we're saying, given the following accounts. Now, notice that there's a whole lot of re repetition in there. So we've got three accounts that all seem to be identical. They all got the same name, all, all got the same type, credit limit, balance, and status. And we don't, therefore don't have any uh, explanation of why we need those things. But we can see that we're also setting up a user. In this case, it happens to have a number 187, but it's got a relationship to an account of number one. So we figured, ah, OK, well, at least we've got, uh, uh, perhaps we need that account because we need to give that to user number 187. Because down here in the when, uh, we're talking about executing a, a statement for player 187. Now, another alarm bell goes there. Why have we referred to a user in one uh, area and a player in another. Are they the same thing? Are they interchangeable? Um, if so, use the same terms. Go for a ubiquitous language. So anyway, it's, it looks like we're saying, OK, we need to create a statement for uh, player 187. Um, and because in our transactions that we've set up as part of our givens, we've got a transaction that number one that's associated with account number one. Therefore, we expect transaction number one to be in player 187's list. OK, fair enough. By the same process, transaction four is also account number one. Therefore, it appears in the then. And number seven, again, also account number one. We see seven down the bottom. So OK, having, having squinted at this for a while and, and seen that relationship, we can sort of, as I say, reverse engineer a business rule out of this, which would probably be expressed something like, uh, when you, uh, make a, when you uh, request a statement for a player, you only get to see the transactions for that player's account and not for other accounts. Not a particularly groundbreaking rule. It's very unlikely that an implementation team is going to not get that rule or not understand that that might be the way this, uh, uh, this player's uh, statement should look. Um, so what about, you know, so having highlighted the bits that perhaps are relevant to that that rule or that part of the test. What's all this other stuff here? What's going on with all this repeated data there? Well, you can sort of imagine somebody who's implemented this or created this saying, well, yeah, in order to prove that I'm only getting the transactions for this player, I needed to have an account for that player, and I needed to have some transactions for other accounts that didn't belong to that player. Therefore, I needed to set up some accounts. And in our system, when you create an account, there's all these mandatory fields. You need to have a name, you need to have a type, you need to have a credit limit, a balance, and so forth. But those things aren't anything to do with this test. So 
what we've got here is the the uh, the the artifact is the victim of uh, the fact that we've got a very generic process, perhaps for building these uh, these items like transactions and accounts. So. It's that, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the phrase of shaving the yak. So someone has tried to you know, uh, uh, create a, uh, uh, an assertion about uh, transactions belonging to particular accounts and what appears and what doesn't. In order to do that, they've had to sort of do all those other uh, irrelevant things that are in the way of actually getting to that point. So really, all that stuff in our spec is just yak hair. It's just things we needed to do in order to get the actual important thing done. But in the process, it's getting in the way. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just noise in our specification. And the same goes for all these other things. You know, the dead giveaway is anything that's very repetitive. So, well, OK, the, the, uh, the stuff to do with the uh, account, all we needed was a relationship between a, an account number and a user ID. So all this other stuff on the account, we don't particularly care about that. We don't care about all this repeated stuff on the transactions. Again, maybe somebody would say, well, yeah, but you ought to prove that in the uh, statement you see the same values that you saw you know, in the original transaction. Well, OK, I'll buy that. That's a fair enough thing to check. But this isn't check it because we've made all those things the same. So I don't know whether I'm actually seeing the details of transaction one or the transactions of detail four because in this test they're exactly the same. I certainly don't need whatever that, com that uh, column on the right-hand side is about. And therefore, I don't need all this stuff in the thens. Now, the only things that I've left not blocked out here are the dates, because surely we know if the, the, the one shred of uh, evidence we have as to what this thing is about comes from the name weekly statement, then there probably is some date processing that's, that's up for grabs here. There probably is something we need to check about the way uh, uh, dates behave. And we know that we've... Uh, uh, ask for this statement on the 7th of January. So you would think, okay, if it is a weekly statement, then we probably want to only see transactions in the seven days up to and including the 7th of January, which is fine. In the, in the results, it does. Our earliest one there is the first, and our latest one there is the 7th. But of course, we've, <laughs> we've got a, uh, a, a dreadful missed opportunity because there is no counterexample. Nowhere in our source data is there a date that's earlier than seven days old, and there's no date, data that's after the seventh. It would have been a much more informative proof that that weekly statement does restrict to a date range if we had examples of transactions for that account earlier than that date and later than the statement date. So, as I say, the one thing that this test could have usefully proven, uh, it doesn't. So, most of this is pretty useless. So. What we're trying to do is have each specification, have each artifact express a rule. It should be, it should be clear about what it's trying to show. This particular example was uh, strongly suggesting that it was created after the fact. And somebody said, OK, well, I've got a basic framework here. I can probably construct a test that shows some of these things. But you wouldn't have had any of that extraneous detail if you were specifying this up front. So, What's the tip here? Well, I always like to start with the then, start with the expectation. So think, what is the thing that I'm trying to change? What is, the, uh, what is unique about what it creates? Express that as a then statement or, or, or set of clauses and think, OK, what are all the givens I need to actually generate the, uh, uh, what, I've, what I've exemplified in the then? Um, similarly, if you're using fitness, think about your right-hand columns. What are the output columns? What combinations of data can I expect to see there? And then fill in your inputs to, uh, uh, to, to get to those outputs. Um, and the third quality that I want us to, to uh, espouse to is, is that of contrast. So let's look at another example here. So a little bit similar to the very first one we saw. It's very user interface-ish, very, uh, uh, very clicky, typey, push button -y, uh, in its expression. Um, and, uh, and look at the, the structure. Well, given when, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and, and then. And it's all sorts of things to do with some kind of shopping cart. So it looks like it's to do with buying uh, music concert tickets or something like that. Very hard to sort of even imagine what the route is. You have to sort of read it several times to try and work out what is the flow going on. But then there's a sort of little magical thing that pops out at the end of, oh, and I get a 10% discount. Now, again, because the 
the, the slim clue I have is that the scenario is called bonus discount. Maybe that 10% is important. But again, where's my rule? How on earth do I know what in that sequence of events has led to a 10% discount? Under what circumstances do I get a different kind of discount or no discount at all? None of these things are evident. We're left guessing as to which of these steps are uh, uh, relevant to leading to that discount. So we can't, we can't infer the rule because we only have a single path, a single example. And of course, the worst thing is that it's, it's run as a, uh, as a script. It's very coupled to the user interface. So um, anyone who's done any kind of uh, 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 study of evolution is, is, is sure to be f familiar with the uh, uh, case of the, the pepper moths. So uh, although it's a little bit grainy, there's two pictures of, of pepper moths on, uh, uh, I think, ash trees uh, in the UK. So uh, a black variety of the pepper moth on the left and a white variety of the pepper moth on the uh, right. And the, uh, the, the, the pepper moth is uh, the, the, the more common variety, the, the white one. Uh, it's uh, evolved to um, be camouflaged against the white lichen that would grow on the ash trees of, of England. And uh, you can see that there is actually both a black and a white moth in both pictures. Uh, we can see the black one if we look carefully there. And even more cunningly disguised, there's a white moth hiding on the lichen there. So you can see very well adapted to uh, being disguised on the white lichen. Of course, uh, the problem is the English Industrial Revolution arrives and the uh, dark satanic mills are spewing out all sorts of uh, coal smoke. The lichen dies off, the trees go black, the uh, uh, otherwise well-hidden white moths now stand out, stand out like a good meal to a bird on the dark trees, and the black moths are now a little better disguised. And hence, we had this radical shift in the uh, population of the white pepper moth versus the black pepper moth as a result of that. Um, why am I showing this? Well, it, because it's the same thing. We can't see the moth if it's the same as its background. If we haven't got a contrast, then we can't see the outline of, of what's there. So we only see the moths by virtue of being able to see the background as well as the foreground. So that's what we were missing in that previous test about the bonus discount, is we perhaps showed a case where a discount applies, but we, we can't see the ground around it. We can't see what else leads to not getting the discount. So um, uh, we need both examples. Some people might call these the, the happy path, if you like. And we need counterexamples. And the two go hand in hand. You, you really only get a complete outline of your scope if you've got both. Um, so let's take a look at what, me, what might be a better example of that. So not exactly the same as bonus discount, but the same sort of realm. So here we're talking about when might we apply free delivery on uh, a shopping cart. And here, just look at the basic structure. We've got a title that's what this feature is about. Free delivery. It's the kind of phrase you might type into Google to sort of understand that part of your application. And we've got, you know, in this case, just a paragraph or two of explanatory text that, in plain language, tells us what is the rule that we're expressing here. You know, so you can imagine this sits quite nicely as documentation, but the very same thing could have been a nice spec that we could have you know, handed from product owner to developers or, or collaboratively created to say, yeah, OK, that's a good expression. Now we understand what this is. And it's supported by examples. Now, the first row in this fitness style test here is arguably the only positive or the only happy path case. It's an example that shows getting free delivery. So a VIP customer is ordering five books, therefore they get their delivery as, as free. And then the other four cases are all counterexamples. They're all just slight variations on that situation, but where you don't get the free delivery. So we're drawing a nice, neat you know, line around the possibilities by varying one of our variables at a time to show that, yes, each one of those things matters in determining free delivery or not. Hence, a VIP customer who uh, orders less than five books doesn't get free delivery. 
Uh, a non-VIP customer ordering five books doesn't. Uh, a regular, uh, sorry, a VIP customer who's ordering something other than books. This is a you know, good example of where a tester might have said, well, yeah, okay, books are fine, but what if they're ordering you know, white goods from our, our site? Are you really going to offer free delivery on five washing machines? Um, and what about if I got the five books, but I also snuck in a washing machine? Do I still get that for free? Yeah. So good questions that a tester would be able to ask, and a product owner should be able to give a definitive answer to that, and that becomes a nice set of examples that specifies the rule. So we're looking for the intersection of focus, balance, and contrast. OK, I'm going to pop in a little um, uh, uh, caveat here, or a little warning, because I do get you know, often at this stage when, when people say, well, OK, you're expecting quite a lot out of our uh, test. We generally don't put that much effort in. And it seems that if we you know, want to do all this fancier, you know, uh, high-fangled uh, testing, that's going to slow down our development process, especially if we're doing this up, up front. And I, so I get this kind of argument a lot from, say, development managers, typically. Uh, and I end up having to concede that, yes, in a fairly limited sense, uh, doing these tests with care up front is going to slow down development, but only in the same way that uh, stopping for passengers slows down the public bus. So be careful of what it is that you measure or you believe is your uh, metric of productivity. Um, it's certainly not the speed of the bus when we're talking about uh, uh, public transport. Um, and similarly, this is, this, is, you know, uh, this is not the point of writing code, is, is producing lines of code faster. Uh, Kent Beck has a nice phrase uh, that says, code that isn't tested doesn't work. This seems to be the safe assumption. I, I, I think that's a, a beautiful phrase. And so if anything, stopping to do these tests well is the only thing that's slowing down is the amount of not working code we're producing. Maybe that is something that needs to be slowed down. So yes, you can sort of imagine the, uh, the bus driver arguing that, well, you know, I notice the old people are the slowest to get on my bus. You know, I think my, 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 I could optimize my process if I didn't stop for the old people. And you know, iteration two is, well, that worked. Um, I'm not going to stop for anyone the next time and see if that gets my numbers up. And uh, uh, so then the next guy says, well, yeah, you don't even have to stop at the bus stop. You can just sort of cruise straight on by. And then the next thing you know, well, we don't need to take this odd zigzagging route across town. We can go straight on the freeway. We'll be back in the depot by 11. So, so optimizing the speed of the bus, be, beware of arguments against sort of doing some of this work uh, because we're, trying, we're worried about slowing down code. Ask the question, are you really measuring the speed of the bus? Um, we'll come towards the end. I just want to uh, leave you with a little story about um, uh, when my, uh, my, my father was an early adopter of uh, alternative sources of energy. Um, he, he was, this was at the time of the oil crises of the 1970s, and I was a, a young kid. And I remember quite distinctly my dad uh, uh, telling me the, the somewhat shocking news that all this petrol we put in our cars was eventually going to run out, um, that there was a, a limited supply, and once it's gone, it's gone. And that's why he was interested in other sources of energy. And I thought that was pretty shocking, and of course I said, well, how long have we got before it runs out? Uh, and he said, well, about 30 years. And of course, to a seven-year-old kid, that's, uh, suddenly you're thinking, well, OK, I'm not going to worry about that. That's four lifetimes away. You know? It's after the year 2000. I'll be in, riding in my jetpack. Um, and of course, time went by. I perhaps didn't pay as much heed to my father's warnings as I should have. Uh, I became a little more uh, green-oriented in my uh, older age. But I did sort of wonder, well, what happened to that prediction about 30 years, as far as I was concerned, that that, that, that deadline had passed. So uh, my brother-in-law works in the oil exploration industry. I thought, if anyone's going to know, he'll know. So I asked Richard, and I say, Rich, the, uh, the oil, how, how long have we got before it all runs out? He said, oh, well, probably about 30 years. I'm thinking, OK, this sounds a bit suspicious. Is there, is there a note somewhere on OPEC that says, if anyone asks about the oil, say 30 years. Um, and I, I, so I recalled the, recalled the story. I said, well, that was kind of the same figure that my dad gave back in the 70s. Have we really found that much more oil? He says, well, that's sort of right. But it's in general, the, these things are based on geological models of the world. And those models have been relatively consistent. We get slightly more sophisticated about knowing what's where and how deep. But overall, it's been static. So what accounts for the difference in the, in the duration? 
Well, it's because the oil isn't sitting there in a great big tank a few feet below the surface just waiting for us to turn the tap on. Oil costs money to get out of the ground. And when you consider that uh, for about 100 years leading up to 1975, I think it was, uh, the, the, the inflation-adjusted price of a, a barrel of oil was five US dollars, then anything that costs you less than five dollars a barrel to get out of the ground is you know, there for the picking, something you can make a profit out of. But anything that costs more than five dollars a barrel, you're not going to bother getting out of the ground because you can't sell that on for a profit. So things that are deep below Arctic ice, you know, or in difficult terrain, dangerous terrain, deep under the oceans, that sort of thing, you're probably going to leave that alone until the price of oil shoots up to $100 a barrel. Suddenly you're looking at the world's oil reserves with a different, uh, uh, different pair of glasses on. So um, what's the point of the, all this? Well, it's the same with the things we create. So the amount of... Uh, uh, value, uh, we, we, uh, or the amount of investment, if you like, that is the, the, the cost to drill, if you like, um, the amount that I invest in that is really a function of how much am I going to get back in return for the thing that I'm getting out. And so it's like the, the market price of the oil. Now, if we just see these artifacts we're creating as tests, then you might get people who say, yeah, well, test, dime a dozen. You know, my testers don't cost very much. I can, I can scale that up. So it's not really worth spending more drilling for these things than what they're, uh, they're giving back to me. So I like to sort of do this thought experiment. I sort of say, well, if I go to an organization and I sort of say, well, the tester's job is to write acceptance tests, I said, okay, well, what if you outsource that to me? How much would you uh, pay me to, uh, to, to create each test? Well, tests aren't worth very much around here. $5. Now that's not good news to me because I, you know, have you seen, I care about the detail of these things. I want you know, these to be, you know, high value artifacts. I'm probably spending $15 a test to, uh, to create that, so that's not economic for me. So I want, might wander off to the developers and say, it seems you guys are really struggling with a lot of rework because you're not getting clear specifications of what you need to do. You know, would that be helpful if I were to do that? You know, how much would that be worth you? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do... Uh, $10 a spec for that, that would be, be useful. I'm thinking, OK, I'm now about to break even. So then I wander off to a business analyst or a, a you know, business person and say, guys, you've got no system documentation here at all. What you do have is out of date and can't be trusted. What if we actually had executable documentation? Documentation, you could push a button and it will tell you which bits of it are no longer true. Oh, magic. Gosh, $20 a page for that. Now I'm thinking, OK. For the one thing that I'm creating, I'm selling that at a total of, what was that? That was 35 or something like that. I'm now making a profit. So this is the secret to you know, being able to justify this extra effort you put into these things is to realize that it can serve multiple purposes. It, can, it's, it provides value to multiple stakeholders. OK, I know we're towards the end. That was the main content, but there is one extra thing I'd like to sneak in if I get the nod. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm assuming it's a primarily developer audience here. Are there any, anyone identify themselves as a tester? I can just see in the dark. Yep, okay, there are a couple. All right, good. I think for that proportion, this is worth doing this little section here. Um, so my phrase that, you know, I, I, when I put this out as a tweet, it seemed to get a lot of action. Um, uh, I say testers are friends, not food. So once again, another Pixar film reference. You can tell I don't have a life, I have kids. All I see is Pixar films. Um, and it refers to the, 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 these sort of sharks who have this mantra that say, well, fish are friends, not food. And they're trying to overcome their reputation of being mindless, killing machines of the ocean. Um, but it's not really to do with uh, arrogance towards testers, or even though I have seen some developers who'd put uh, Brucey and his mates to shame. Um, it's more the fact that uh, when we're talking about testing, it's more of a function of what is it we do. And so I see it as being like friendship in the sense of, well, you know, how would you know someone is a friend? And I sort of think there's this universal uh, um, uh, measure, I suppose, that you, it seems to work, every country I, I test this in, is you know, you'd call someone a friend if they're the kind of person who would help you move your sofa. I and mean, I think that probably works in Denmark. Of course, the sofa would be much better designed than that here in Denmark, but, but I think it probably is the same, uh, the same threshold. Um, uh, reserved for a few people above that, you know, the people you might call best friends, those are people who help you move a dead body. Um, 
but and then you know below there's 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 everyone else there's your there's your facebook friends um so it begs the question well if if what 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 are you what what role do you play um Maybe uh, it's useful to think of, uh, imagine this scenario. So most people here in the room are, are developers. So imagine you're, um, uh, you're a developer and, and someone new has joined, joined your team. So a new developer has joined your team. And maybe after a, you know, a couple of days, she's, uh, she turns around and she said, oh, hi, look, um, I've just coded up my first feature. I think I'm done on it. But I could really do with um, a tester to help me check that I've implemented it correctly. Could, could you help? Now, you might feel that you're within your rights to say, oh, sorry, didn't anyone explain I'm, I'm a developer, not a tester? You sort of you know, wheel your chair around and carry on with what you were doing. Now, what if that same person had asked exactly the same question, but she only changed one word? And she said, oh, hi, look, I've just coded up my first feature, uh, and I could really do with a friend to help me see that I've implemented it correctly. Would you help? Now, are you going to turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a developer, not a friend? It doesn't really make any sense to sort of, uh, you know, view our, our roles as if they exist in silos. You know, just as we are, we are all friends to some extent, we are friends to some people by virtue of, you know, what actions are we doing to help them? That's the way I see testing. Testers are friends on the team who help us get better at producing good quality software. So for some people, that's their specialism. But for others, it's just part of the way they work. So let's try to you know, forget this idea that there are sort of different breeds of people, that there are developers and there are testers as separate things. So just as we earn the right to be uh, uh, called a friend by virtue of our actions, the uh, value we bring to the team is determined not by our roles, but by our deeds. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Does anyone have any questions? And I'll put the whole slide up and just remind you of what I talked about in case there is. We have one quite early in this talk. Have you also got some examples of, on doing it right? Well, as I say, there's probably only one that I would consider to be you know, uh, an example that I would, I would hold up as a good example, and that was the free delivery example. And of course, that was the, uh, uh, the one that I constructed rather than picked out of the wild. Um, I think the nature of the work I do means that I see more bad examples than good examples. But uh, yes, I would, I would look, if you're going back into the slides, pick out the free delivery, you know, the, the VIP and four, five books example. That has all the elements that I think make a good specification. A good title, just enough introductory text to explain the rules, and examples that directly support the content of those rules. So a good relation between what we say it should be done and the examples that demonstrate that being done. And to have those examples include positive examples and counterexamples. That, I think, is your formula for a good spec. Any other questions before we leave? Uh, yeah. OK, so the question is when you're starting to get a large number of tests that you're sort of uh, you know, uh, moving into a regression suite over time, how do you keep that maintainable? Well, the very you know, recognizing that you have that potential problem is your start. You, know, you do need to treat this as something that, that requires a bit of care, because otherwise it will be a dumping ground, and it will slow you down, because you'll find you know, breakages that you are not sure why they're broken. People sort of start to give up on fixing those things, because they'll say, oh, yeah, it's probably just the test is no longer relevant, and so forth. Well, uh, uh, I always think the next step after a, a story is implemented is I'm now sort of almost committing it to the, the documentation phase. So I like to personally make as part of the definition of done, are we happy with what this, this uh, uh, executable specification says about the work that we've done? Does it sit neatly in terms of its relationship to other things that we have already got? So if you're using something like fitness, there's a, it's naturally very strong on this because each page is just a wiki page, so you can have a, a lot of good positive links to related uh, concepts. A little harder to do that with things like Cucumber and SpecFlow, but uh, uh, it, it's still possible to do that. So I think, yes, associating with related concepts is important. Treating it as if 
you know, th this is documentation, not just a regression test, but also I think just having the practice of making sure that regression suite is run automatically. You know, make, make sure the build server is doing that nightly at least, so that at least we're getting fast feedback if it turns out that new functionality has broken it. So yeah, maintainability comes from making sure it's always running green. So in some cases, that will mean you've picked a, a genuine regression error. In other cases, it means that the documentation got out of date. But either of those cases are, in my mind, a stop the line situation. If we find that, that our system behavior no longer matches what we say the system behavior is, stop and fix that. So I think it's just about taking regression uh, uh, errors or regression sweet breakages as seriously as you would any, uh, you know, a, a breakage of a unit test. Anyone else? Uh, can you talk about some examples of documentation that are successful after, let's say, a system is built or most of the software is shipped? Um, you talked about living code should be a good example, but I, I know maybe some product owners or business folks would be intimidated to uh, look at those yeah, there's a nice, uh, well, several nice stories uh, uh, documented in uh, my colleague's book. So I work in partnership with Goiko Adzic, so his book specification by example, if you'll excuse me, a quick plug on that. That's got a number of, of real case studies in there. And uh, uh, something like the Iowa student loan example is a good one because this was uh, an organization that was uh, uh, creating student loans based on uh, the bond market. And uh, when the bond market sort of you know, collapsed in the US, they were at risk of their entire business model was no longer being relevant. And they felt, well, they needed to change that very quickly. They knew they had good core IT systems. They knew they had, you know, uh, they still had a demand in the market, but they needed to work out how do we, how do we change the, 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 the model that sits at the heart of this. And they've said that they wouldn't have been able to make that change so uh, you know, what would otherwise have been seen as a, a high-risk change to their, uh, their core model if they didn't have it extremely well documented and they had lots of examples that they could say, all right, well, what, are, what happens in this case? And they could actually go directly to the specifications to say, all right, this is what it would look like under the new world. And that gave them a very you know, a strong position of confidence to go and be able to change their business quite fundamentally. So I think that was a, you know, a, a business critical case of where living documentation allowed them to make that change. But yeah, so try the book. It's got some, a lot of interesting cases like that. Excellent. Okay, well, I think I'm over my, my budget. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. <laughs>